Okay, good morning everyone, or I guess Jasmine, since she's the only one that will probably watch this, but maybe. Uh, we are looking at putting the test on Monday, in case you're not here and didn't get to hear that, or you forget sometime during the day and decide to watch the lecture. But we're moving on to chapter 28, and a new class of compounds called lipids. And lipids encompass a variety of compounds, and we'll kind of go through those one class of compounds at a time. And what we want to kind of be focusing on when we think about these things is, you know, first of all, you need to be able to recognize them. You need to be able to draw, and you need to sort of understand the nomenclature. So that's much the same, no men, whatever. I don't care if it's spelled right, I guess. It's probably still spelled wrong. Sort of like the, with the carbohydrates, you know, if I say, do the, you know, draw galactose, you should be able to draw galactose. If we talk about, you know, alpha hydroxies do this, or if we say that the beta isomer does this, or if we talk about a glycosidic bond, same thing with lipids. We're going to have an, our own set of terminology for various parts of it. Most of the terminology for lipids, though, because it's in uh, more focus sort of w in our daily lives or we hear more about it due to things like cardiovascular disease and sort of nutrition issues, we'll find that we are more familiar with those terms. And we might know what they mean and we may or may, you know, but we might not. We might really just say, oh, yeah, I've heard omega-3 fatty acids are good to me. What the hell is an omega-3 fatty acid? I mean, you can go see it on a label, but what does it really mean? And if you've had nutrition, some of this might be reviewed, some of it might not. So, you know, we want to focus on recognizing, drawing, and understanding nomenclature. We want to take a look at the physical properties. And with the idea that the physical properties often lead to a discussion about the biological properties. So, for instance, you know, if we're thinking or reviewing a little bit, uh, cellulose is connected by what type of bonds? It's glucose connected by alpha 1, 4 glycosidic bonds, right? We're at, wait, which one did I say? I forgot now which one I said. Anyway, let's start over. Starch is alpha 1, 4 glycosidic bonds. Um, cellulose is beta 1, 4 glycosidic <coughs> bonds, right? And that difference between alpha and beta, that's simply whether that OH on one end of the molecule points up or that OH points down, right? That difference has a lot of impacts on what the structure is and what the biological uses and properties of those molecules are. So the same thing with lipids. We want to focus on those small physical differences or those small chemical differences and see how that impacts their biological properties. And then... You know, the biology in this chapter, I won't say that it's complicated. I'm just going to say that it may be right or it may be wrong in that there's always continual research on all of these topics. And while there are some general rules of thumb that we can say, you know, like unsaturated fats seem to be better than saturated fats, there's even a study I was reading this morning over breakfast that says, you know, statistically, it's not that much different. That really, um, human health and nutrition and the impact of diets and the impact of various, you know, food sources and compounds on your body is really complicated. And what may be okay for one person may not be okay for another person. You know, we all know you can point to your 99-year-old grandma that chain smokes, eats uh, raw meat every day, and has never heard of a vitamin or a mineral in her life, right? I don't know, maybe some, maybe not everyone, but, you know, a lot of people can point to that, right? But, you know, on average, probably, smoking, not so healthy for you, right? I mean, that's one I think most people can kind of agree on. And, you know, that's okay. Jess won't live long enough. She'll get bucked off a horse and break her skull. So the smoking probably doesn't impact her life so much. So when we go through the biology, you realize that if you go read another website that says, oh, no, this is good for you, or you read another, you know, you can go out and you can find contradictory websites. You can go out and find contradictory information. Sarah might have told you something totally different. Feel free to call me on it and say, hey, Jay, 
Sarah said this, and we'll take a look at it. And like I said, this study right here points out and says all those things that we thought were bad for us, well, they probably are in excess, but on your average diet, if it's fairly well balanced, it doesn't matter. So it's a tough call to say on some of that biology stuff how things work and interact. And we also have to realize the body is very, very complicated. We'll look at some bioenergetics, some biochemical pathways in detail when we get to the bioenergetics chapters in like a couple weeks. For now, we'll kind of use box diagrams and we'll skip all the hard steps in between and not really focus on the actual chemical reactions, but you know, on the overall idea behind it. And so really when we think about biology, it is super complicated because there's a lot of stuff going on. There's millions of different, okay, millions might be an exaggeration, but there's at least thousands of different molecules running around in your body and thousands and thousands and millions of chemical reactions occurring all the time. And how that all works, and we don't kill over dead every other day, I don't know. So anyway, what I want you to focus on is primarily this, primarily this, and I want you to know some, meaning you should have, you should be able to carry on a conversation or make a brief statement about things, but we're going to focus less on that because I'm going to be honest, it's less true, meaning if I say something has an aldehyde, it has an aldehyde functional group, right? There's no debate about that. Um, if we say that omega-6 fatty acids are bad for you and omega-3 fatty acids are good for you, there's not as much debate about that, but there certainly is some as to you know, whether that's true of statement or not. So we want to talk about lipids. And maybe we should even compare and contrast that to carbohydrates sort of what I'm trying to do is build that big picture and we kind of get a mini review in here. So if we're looking at carbohydrates and we're looking at lipids, for instance, what was the defining characteristic of carbohydrates? Something they all had in common. Lots of H's. So they're called sometimes polyhydroxy aldehydes or ketones, where poly means lots, right? Hydroxy is that OHs that Brittany was talking about, and they all have an aldehyde or a ketone functional group, right? What we're going to learn about lipids is that there's no general structure, meaning you can't point to, or you can point to two different compounds that look completely different, and they can both be lipids. Now, they do have some features in common, in that, for instance, they all are, tend to be water insoluble. Or we might call that hydrophobic. Do you guys remember that word from earlier? And so there's no general structure that's the same. What we do for lipids or how we think about lipids is we just say that all the types of molecules that are water insoluble will lump together as lipids. And so lipids have a huge and widely varied set of functions in the body and set of uses in the body. And so, you know, I don't know, you could easily break these down into different categories. Now, we will break them down into a bunch of different categories. For instance, we'll talk about what we call simple lipids, and we'll talk about complex lipids. Oh, what other one do we have? Make sure I'm getting them com uh, complex or compound. We'll talk about steroids. And we'll talk about, I just lump it together and we call it the miscellaneous group. And then each group in there will have several subcategories. So realize that under that big broad umbrella of, an, of lipids, we're going to go and talk about each of the different types of lipids kind of individually as we go. So. Let's take a look at that second part. What makes something water insoluble? So if we talk about hydrophobic versus hydrophilic for contrast, what types of things are hydrophobic? That means that they are, tend to be insoluble, and these tend to be soluble. The idea is that this is 
water fearing. That's what the phobic part means. And hydrophilic tends to mean water loving. I mean, if we're kind of directly translating the words, it's good ways to remember it. But what sort of things are hydrophobic? Oil. What's an oil? That's, that's a non-chemistry type term, meaning it's a generic term. We will actually talk about things that are oils and we'll say what an oil really is, which is, I guess, kind of what I'm getting at. So what I'm saying is, is kind of take a look at these from a chemistry perspective. So yeah, something that's hydrophobic are things like oils, fats, obviously lipids, but what's, what chemical or functional groups are there? Yeah, long chains of carbon. So that is something that's hydrophobic, which also means anything that has carbon-carbon double bonds is primarily composed of carbon-carbon triple bonds. And then we said that there's two other functional groups that are sort of hydrophobic, or at least not very hydrophilic. What were those? Do you guys remember? Yeah, we have to remember that organic chemistry shit. I should have mentioned that during those chapters, but I probably forgot to mention that you have to remember it, right? Is my sarcasm good enough? So what two more functional groups that are tend to be pretty hydrophobic? Things that don't dissolve well in water. So let's just start going through our fun functional groups in order. So we've already got alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, right? What was next in that chapters? Yeah, we had ethers. Which category does that go under? Yeah, ethers tend to be kind of insoluble because the thing that ethers have is only that one oxygen, and that's not much. Meaning, yeah, that has a slight attraction to water, but not very much. What was after ethers? in our orders. Well, if we're going in the order we covered in the book, no, but um, esters actually fit in this category too. Even though they have a carbonyl group, compared to the amount of alkane, that's usually very small in comparison. So we would say that, yeah, an ester group gives a little bit of solubility, gives a little bit of ability to interact with water, but not a lot. What about what was our next functional group after ethers? No, you guys are going way out of order. But where would am amides and amines go in this category? Amines, because they can form those, oops, I guess we'll just do it this way. Because amines can form hydrogen bonds, they tend to be uh, hydrophilic. Now, if I have a tertiary amine that has no hydrogen bonding capability, where does that go? You know, we have to remember that amines are complicated, right? Tertiary amines actually go over in that hydrophobic category, right? Same thing with amides. Depending upon the type of amide it is, that carbon double bonded to an oxygen to an NH2 is pretty soluble, but like a tertiary amide, if it can't form those hydrogen bonds anymore, or the R group gets big enough on any of these, then they tend to be insoluble, right? OK, so you've kind of picked the ones that are mostly hydrophobic, a little bit hydrophilic. What's ones that are really hydrophilic? Carboxylic acids. No. Yeah, carboxylic acids. That carboxylic acid functional group tends to be very soluble. Alcohol. And alcohols. OH functional groups tend to be very soluble. And so when we say something soluble or insoluble, or we kind of have a picture of something, we want to be able to look at the functional groups in that molecule and to make a general statement about what, whether it's soluble or insoluble. With the caveat that we know that if there's enough alkane, it doesn't matter how much of the other stuff we have on there it's going to be insoluble, right? So for instance, carbohydrates have, oh, we forgot to mention aldehydes and ketones. Oops. Let's see, did we forget any other ones in there? Nope, that's it. So 
For instance, carbohydrates that have aldehydes, ketones, and lots of OH groups tend to be very soluble, right? We know that we can take sugar and we can dissolve a whole lot of it in water before you can't dissolve any more sugar, right? Now, if you put oil and water together, what happens? It doesn't mix at all, so it's not hydrophobic in the least. So when we're looking at, you know, saying that there's no general structure, that's true, but, you know, we expect to see a lot of that in most of our uh, lipids. Okay, so in our category of simple lipids, we have a number of different compounds. And I'll double check. I'm pretty sure I have the number is three. And as an overview, oops, I, got a, I can't abbreviate yet because we haven't put the word down first. We have fatty acids. And we'll talk about waxes. And we'll talk about fats and oils. And what we're really going to learn is that fatty acids are just large carboxylic acids. In fact, if you remember the chapter on carboxylic acids, we actually had and talked about fatty acids already. We're going to learn that waxes are simply large esters. So even though the carboxylic acid in a fatty acid is hydrophilic, because we've got such a large R group attached to it, such we've got such a big alkane part, it's going to be insoluble. And then fats and oils are esters also, but they're esters specifically of something that we call glycerol and three fatty acids. So glycerol is an alcohol, and then the fatty acids are the carboxylic acid. Because remember, esters are simply alcohols plus uh, carboxylic acids make esters for chemical reactions. So when we look at a fatty acid, this is probably the category that we have sort of the most information on that we can kind of delve into the deepest. So they're giant carboxylic acids, which means that the R group is usually on the order of 16 plus carbons long. And so, you know, if we drew a typical one, we've got to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And this has a name. It's called palmitic acid. But you're going to be given that on the cheat sheet. So just like, for instance, I told you, you don't have to memorize any of the carbohydrates, you don't have to memorize any of the molecules that we're talking about. You do have to be able to point out features of them. You do have to realize that that's a fatty acid and things like that. But you know, if I say draw palmitic acid, it's a pretty easy test question because you'll have that on the cheat sheet. Now if I say draw the reaction of palmitic acid and something else, now we're starting to go a little harder, right? And things like that. But realize that just because it's a bigger molecule doesn't make any of the chemistry that we're going to talk about any more difficult. It just means you've got to draw lots more carbons, so it's more tedious instead of more difficult. There's also a table on page 764, table 28.1. So when you're doing your homework, you'll probably have to access that. I'll try to remember to print off the cheat sheet here. I forgot to do it when I was printing the homework off yesterday, so I apologize for that. But since all the stuff on the cheat sheet is also in your book, I don't feel terribly bad about it. And then with the fatty acids, there's a number of different characteristics that we can talk about them. So in general, they are straight chained. Oops, that's not how you spell straight. Versus they could be, of course, branched. But what we find is that in nature, we favor straight chains. And I think the reason for that is that they're simple. And so it's easy to have a single biological pathway that works.
And like I said, we'll talk about those biological pathways in a lot more detail when we get to the bioenergetics chapter. Sometimes I kind of think that they need to, like they should have just mixed in the bioenergetics when they were talking about things. Because what we'll find is that we're going to have another chapter where we talk about this is how the body metabolizes carbohydrates. This is how the body metabolizes lipids. This is how the body me uh, metabolizes enzymes, or not enzymes, um, amino acids and proteins. And so we'll come back to all the things we're talking about today later on. And so uh, nature favors the straight chains probably because they're easier. If I have a, something that looks like this, you know, and I'm not going to draw a giant one, but it's got a bunch of branches, and then it's got a branch here and maybe a branch there. Well, if your chemical reaction simply breaks it here and expects a single uh, set of carbons on it, then, you know, I can break this repeatedly like this and always get the same chunk, right? Whereas if I try to break this, who knows where I have to break those side chains, I get all sorts of different chunks of that molecule, right? So from a perspective of usability and building something, it's much easier to build and take apart a straight chain than it is to build and take apart a branch chain for a compound. And so we tend to find that the branch chains are favored. There's another little oddity. We tend to favor the even number of carbons. Oops, even number of carbons. Ugh, can't spell. Versus an odd number of carbons. Meaning there's nothing that says, you know, we have to have 16 carbons or 18 carbons or 20 carbons. We can certainly build, especially in chemistry, something that has 19 or 17 or 15, but it turns out that, again, nature favors those even chains. And this is where you can get into some deep questions. Why? And probably the reason that it favors an even number is that every time you break apart an even number, you get a chunk of two, right? But if you have an odd number, then you're going to get a chunk of two, a chunk of two, and eventually you get just a single carbon to make an odd number, right? So, you know, for instance, 12 makes, you know, divided by two makes six even chunks, right? But if I take 11 divided by two, I get five two carbon chunks, and I get one one carbon chunk. And so having that leftover chunk having that single carbon floating around probably isn't terribly useful. And so even numbered carb or even numbered fatty acids kind of are the general rule. And in fact, if you go look at table 28.1, it doesn't even list any odd numbered fatty acids at all because they're just not not found in nature. Now, here's another thing that you guys have heard before and that should be a review. What if I have saturated versus unsaturated? What does that mean? It's unsaturated versus saturated when we're talking about a fatty acid. Or really, that term is the same for all compounds, right? Sorry, Alyssa, I cut you off. What did you say? Uh, no, you were answering the question, so that's good. Hmm? What? Yeah, so an unsaturated fatty acid has less than the maximum number of carbons, or maximum number of hydrogens. And this has the maximum number of carbon-hydrogen bonds. But that's kind of, that might be the more official definition. But what, what feature does it tell us we have in a molecule if it's unsaturated versus saturated? Yeah, it contains carbon-carbon double bonds. And for saturated, it's no carbon-carbon double bonds. Now, notice I'm limiting this discussion to carbon-carbon double bonds. Certainly, if you have a carbon-carbon triple bond in a molecule, that makes it unsaturated also. But we're looking at this from the biological perspective, or at least trying to think about it in terms of biology, in which case we don't find very many carbon-carbon triple bonds at all, but we do find frequently carbon-carbon double bonds. And if we kind of look at that, the fact that it's unsaturated versus saturated gives it some different characteristics. For instance, what we find is that unsaturated fatty acids are generally found in plants. 
whereas the saturated fatty acids are generally found in animals. Now, is there a reason for that? Who knows? And again, that's a, uh, a generalization, right? Meaning, certainly you can find omega-3 fatty acids in animals, right? Because what's a good source of omega-3 fatty acids? Fish. Or specific types of fish. It turns out that the unsaturated ones generally have lower melting points and tend to be liquids. Whereas saturated fatty acids have higher melting points and tend to be solids. And the reason for that is that if you take a look at it, a carbon-carbon double bond forms a kink in the molecule. <coughs> Meaning that if I'm drawing this molecule, right, when I have a carbon-carbon double bond, I need to show that this molecule is kinked, or if it's the cis version, then it makes them kinked. Whereas in the saturated fatty acids, they're just nice long chains. And I guess since we're talking about fatty acids, how should I make sure it's a fatty acid? You've got to make sure they're carboxylic acids, right? And so what happens is these just form these nice long chains. And so here they can interact a lot. Therefore, the LDFs are larger, or at least there's more interaction between the chains. And what do we know about the London dispersion forces and the attractive forces between molecules? High attractive forces between them make them have higher melting points and boiling points, right? It takes more energy to separate those molecules apart. So these tend to pack closely. These tend to pack loosely. Uh, that's not even how you spell loosely. Loosely. I think that's how you spell it. Um, continuing our list, we've got unsaturated, saturated. Unsaturated fatty acids tend to spoil quickly for whatever reason, whereas saturated fatty acids tend to have long shelf lives. Oh, gosh. Long lasting, how about that? Um, if we kind of look at their biological effects, here's where what I was talking about earlier tends to be. tougher, meaning the research and the literature on it is not as good. So which one is generally considered better for you? Yeah, the unsaturated are tend to be better in your diet because they increase, oops, wait, let me got this backwards, they increase HDLs, which is the good sort for you, and they decrease LDLs. And let me put that up there since I kind of am going a little out of order for normal. So HDL stands for high density lipoproteins. And of course, what does LDL stand for then? Low density lipoproteins. And we can even have VLDLs, which stands for very low density lipoproteins. I don't know if they have another one like MDLs, which stand for mega high density MHD. No, I'm just kidding. We can kind of take this to an extreme if we want. Um, we'll go into more detail in this when we talk about ether. Oh atherosclerosis, and we talk about um, heart disease. 
So I'm going to delay the big discussion on it, but we're going to mention it here so that it's in your notes and you got it. And so biologically, the saturated ones are not as good. They tend to increase the LDL, which is the bad one for you, and they tend to decrease the HDL, which is considered the good one for you. Oh, boy. And we should also point out that this goes in both columns. Really, the key is excess is bad. Probably a reasonable amount of both in your diet isn't going to kill you. It's when you have a large excess of it. For instance, this is where I was talking about if we go and read here this new study that kind of contradicts or at least calls into doubt a lot of the stuff in our book. And I was going to print this off for you guys, but the printer wasn't working this morning, so we're just going to read it real quick. Um, blah, 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 analyzed 600 studies or no, 72 unique studies with over 600,000 partic 600, participants in 18 nations. So there's lots and lots of information about it. And what they said is that uh, when they analyze studies involving assessments of the total consumption of uh, monounsaturated fats versus long chain polysaturated fats, that there's no significant association between the consumption and the cardiovascular risk. Meaning that as far as they could tell, on a big scale, didn't matter which of the two you had. And that they also found that, uh, we haven't talked about omega-6 and three fatty acids yet, but that, um, uh, let's see, that actually it depends on the specific omega-3 and the specific omega-6 more than just what's been generalized in the past, which is omega-3 good, omega-6 bad. And so, it turns out that this is a lot more complicated. So how many people, for instance, I have a friend that's way into, always takes his fish oil extract every day. How many people have a friend like that that takes something or takes them themselves? Maybe good, maybe bad. And it also turns out that it depends on which uh, fish oil you're taking. It might depend on the specific brand or how it's processed as to whether you'll get the healthy effects or not. Just like, for instance, eating different types of fish have different levels of omega-3. Salmon and things like that, awesome. Um, the new fish that a lot of people, especially Jess likes this. Oh, wait, she is awake. Uh, actually, I have no idea if she likes fish or not. Um, uh, what's the new one that everyone likes to go out and eat? The tilapia or something? Tilapia. Yeah, that one. Apparently, that's got none of the good omega fatty acids in it, and it's actually worse than eating a hamburger. Well, if fish tastes like fish, you're doing no, something I'm wrong. The idea is fish caught fresh does not taste like fish. Fish kept too long or improperly prepared tastes like fish no matter what you do. Even salmon will taste like fish if it's old enough. So realize that we're going to say in general that unsaturated fatty acids are better for you. But there's certainly evidence out there that there may be actually no big difference between the two. And it may have more to do with the ratio of the two that you have or the very specific types you have. So eating one type of fatty acid might be good for you, whereas eating the, another type that has the same category, it's unsaturated, might be equally bad for you. And so really, unfortunately, it's not very easy to tell what's good and what's bad. OK, so if we have unsaturated fatty acids, so this kind of goes under unsaturated. That means we have carbon-carbon double bonds, right? And we have two types of carbon-carbon double bonds. What are they? Taylor, you answered this question earlier, even though, yeah. So I've got the cis isomer, and I've got the trans isomer. And what's the difference between cis and trans? Yeah, so what a cis isomer tends to look like is something like this, where it's bent over on itself. And then I guess we should make this a um, fatty acid by remembering to add the fatty acid functional group. And a trans isomer, if we're kind of drawing them, has that 
carbon double bond carbon like that, but it's more linear. And so this tends to be uh, globular, and it packs less well. This tends to be mostly linear. Oh. And I keep on forgetting to draw the carboxylic acid functional group on the end. So don't forget to put that in your notes, and don't forget to do it in your homework, and don't forget to do it on tests. I have to be honest, this chapter and some of these chapters is really easy to make what I call stupid mistakes, like forgetting to draw the functional group at the end of a molecule. That's silly. So they're mostly linear. In that respect, they're a little like the saturated fats in that they tend to pack pretty well. And, you know, on the, what I would call the first level of theory as to why cis, cis fatty acids are better for you than trans fatty acids is simply because the cis ones are globular and don't stack, whereas the trans ones do stack and look a lot like saturated fatty acids. That's, you know, the generally how people explain why one's good for you and one's bad for you. I got to be honest, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I think it, I think that's a really simple, maybe what you would say, freshman chemistry answer, but by the time you get to senior level chemistry, they'll be like, no, nah, it's way more complicated than that. That's one of the things I learned in chemistry. We tell you all sorts of simplifications, and then you learn it's way more complicated later on if you take more chemistry. So we are going to say that the cis ones are generally better for you. So they're good for you. And these are considered bad for you. Now, here's the, here, here's the kicker. I'm not going to tell you why one's considered good for you and one's considered bad for you, because I don't think anyone really knows. I mean, most of this is based on huge health studies where they go through and they measure the health of thousands and thousands and even hundreds of thousands of people. And we know how much variety there is probably just sitting in this room between various people's diets, right? Like, for instance, I can't remember the last time I ate a vegetable. Boy, let's see. I'm going to get Chinese food. They usually stick some vegetables in theirs. And I haven't had Chinese for like two weeks, so it might be two weeks since I had a vegetable. Now, I like fruits a lot, so I eat more fruits, but... Yeah, I'm not so good on the veggies. For instance, can anyone here say, when's the last time you had a steak? Yeah, living the high life, I see some people. But, you know, everyone's diet differs. How about exercise? How many people would say they exercise an hour a day? Walking a dog is not exercise. That's a little bit. Okay, there you go. That's more exercise then. Even though riding a bike's not very hard either. That's true. Anyway, everyone has different levels of activity. And then there's the whole genetic component, right? How many people's parents, hopefully you're still alive, so let's maybe talk about grandparents. How many people's gran had at least one grandparent that died of a heart attack? You know, or maybe cancer. Or, you know, there's some trends that we can find for what people tend to die of, or you know, various biological effects like that. Now, one of the things, or one of the reasons that cis might be good for you, so I'll put this down, maybe, that this is generally most commonly found in nature. Now, the thing is, is I'm not going to tell you why it's the one most commonly found in nature. I'm not sure. It might simply be that because of that globular shape, that physical aspect of it means that it's easier to deal with biologically, whereas trans is very rare in nature. But there are some examples of natural trans fatty acids that are actually very good for you. So most of these are man-made. They take a unsaturated fatty acid that's a cis, or they, take, they either take an unsaturated fatty acid or they take a cis fatty acid, and they do what's called hydrogen, dehydrogenation, they remove hydrogens from it to make trans fatty acids. So if we do it by a, a biological process, when we add double bonds to molecules, we tend to add the cis double bond. When we do uh, add double bonds to things chemically, <coughs> we tend to make the trans isomer. And so, like I said, 
I don't know if that's why the cis ones are probably better for you because your body is evolved or adapted to, uh, to deal with it, whereas your body is not used to dealing with the trans ones. Now again, that study I talked about here said um, they found very weak positive associations between um, saturated fatty acids and cardiovascular disease, whereas the unsaturated ones uh, reduce the risk. So they found a small correlation, they said, but not nearly as bad as what normal people talk about. Um, I'm trying to remember if this, is the art if this article concluded that. Oh yeah, it said the best way to stay heart healthy is to stop smoking, stay active, and ensure your whole diet is healthy. It means having a varied diet. Notice the one, the first thing he said, Jess. My new, my new, my new task is to, I'm going to convince Jess to stop smoking. I'll give you an A. That might actually work. Everyone else is going to start smoking, so I have to give them the same thing, right? Yeah. That's good. Okay, one last category of sort of these differences in fatty acids. I forgot what number I'm on. Probably five. is omega-3 versus omega-6. So what, does anyone know what the omega-3 and the omega-6 mean? Yes, so omega is actually a W that's kind of curled in on itself, actually. So it's really not a W, it's really kind of curled in more like that to be omega. So yes, that's the symbol for omega. one of those Greek letter thingies, you know, like alpha and beta and stuff. We tend to use, overuse them in chemistry and things like that. So omega-3 and omega-6 are telling us the location. Actually, this goes for both of them, so, because it's just the definition. The location of the first carbon-carbon double bond from the omega end, which is the end with the CH3. So omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. It means N. So when we say omega-3 fatty acid, we're saying that that carbon-carbon double bond is in the, on the third, between the third and fourth carbon. Omega-6 is between the sixth and seventh. So if I drew an example, you know, here's my fatty acid. What this is saying is one, two, three. That's the omega-3 position. And that in an omega-6 fatty acid, I still have a big, long fatty acid. But instead, it's on the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's an omega-6 fatty acid. I find it amazing that the simply the location of a carbon-carbon double bond can determine where or how, whether something is good or bad for us. Doesn't that seem kind of cheesy? But think about it the location kind of or the orientation of an OH group, alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond versus beta 1,4 glycosidic bond determines whether something is good or bad kind of too, right? Or at least something that makes potatoes versus something that tastes like wood. So really tiny changes biologically have really huge, or not biological, really tiny changes in the structure of a molecule have very large of changes on kind of the overall structure of the molecules it makes or the chemical and biological properties of said molecule. Now we normally consider these good and we normally consider these bad. But like I said, if you read the study that I was reading this morning, they're kind of saying it's not so much omega-3 and the omega-6, but it's uh, the very specific source of the omega-3 and the omega-6 that might matter. And that some omega-6s are good for you and some omega-3s are good for you. Now, like I said, that's this newest study. The, generally, what your book will say and what you'll normally read is that omega-3 is much, much better for you than omega-6. So I want you to realize that I'm trying to tell you the truth. I really am. I just am not sure we know what the truth is for this, right? You know, I can tell you 2 plus 2 is 4. That's definitely true. I can't tell you whether eating fish oil is going to make your life better or not. It might just make you smell like fish, which explains a couple of you. Um, 
the general reasoning behind this, the reason people say the omega-3s are good for you and the omega-6s are bad, is that there's a class of molecules called ecosans. And these are fatty acid molecules, or they're derived from fatty acid molecules that are chemically modified. to create local hormones. You guys know what a local hormone is? You know what a hormone is. It's something that has a, so local hormones basically have local, oops, local biological effects. Probably the hormones most people are familiar with are things like steroids and then the sex hormones. Uh, there's a lot of other sort of hormones in the body that allow things to happen. Modified. Chemically modified to create local hormones. For instance, this is one of the steps where we're going to skip all the chemistry because the chemistry is exaggerated, or not exaggerated, the chemistry is complicated. There's no point in looking at this very specific one. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the general broad idea behind these. So an example of an omega-3 fatty acid that forms an eco, that leads to ecosans is there's linoleic acid. And in an example of the omega-6 fatty acids are usually arachidonic acid. So the idea is that these molecules are the parent molecules for building lots of different um, types of molecules. For instance, we'll take a look specifically at the arachidonic acid. So if I take arachidon, I should also point out, I tend to jump around a little bit in that, and I tend to skip a few things because I'm trying to get the highlights. I'm trying to, I got to be honest, sometimes I feel like I bullet point these lectures just a little too much. Trouble is, is if I don't bullet point them, these lectures seem to take forever. I highly recommend reading the book because the book will connect all these points together a second time for you. And in these chapters, the book's actually pretty good on the biology side of things. Meaning, it does, a, it, it, biology to me, uh, to a certain extent, there's a good chunk of memorization involved in it. What's good, what's bad. Um, it's not so much, it's always a process. And so in this case, reading the book might help reinforce a lot of these ideas for you. That and I might, you know, occasionally skip something. Like, what did I skip on our last lecture? That was horrible. Yeah, I, that's a big one because that's a very easy test to do to determine whether something's basically fructose or some other sugar. And so it's a common test. So if we take, for example, and this would be an example of a metabolic pathway. What we find is that if we start with arachidonic acid, arachidonic. OK, now how many people, when they say the word arachidonic acid, think of spiders? Oops. Yeah, that's what I think of always. I always call this the spider acid. So arachidonic acid, and we're going to call this a parent molecule. Or sometimes you might see this called a precursor molecule. And what happens is there's a series of chemical reactions. So a series of chemical reactions modifies the uh, molecule. And in this case, it can lead to a series of molecules called thromboxanes, prostacyclins, and prostaglandins. And for future interest, this is 
mediated by a molecule or an enzyme called cyclooxygenase. So what does that ASE ending mean? Yeah. Just knowing that an ASE ending is an enzyme, for instance, if you read an article that talks about how does this medication help reduce heart attacks, well, it might tell you that it blocks cyclooxygenase. And so what do you know at that point? Well, the drug that you're taking is slowing down or blocking a metabolic pathway in your body, thus reducing the production of some molecule. And so if you can kind of get a big idea or the big picture behind this, when you read health articles or you read information about drugs uh, that you might be taking, it, you might... Uh, you might kind of learn something. You might have a better understanding for it. Now, I have to be honest. How many of you guys are on terribly much medication? Hopefully not at this young age. Now, go home and check your parents or your grandparents' uh, medicine cabinets. My dad's on so much crap. Holy cow. You know, it's like he's got high blood pressure medicine. He's got this medication. He's got that medication. Yeah, like, like when, when that, I have a friend, too. When they travel, they've got these, like, you know, they, they, they'll have their pill boxes, right? And they actually have to have two sets of pill boxes that got so many damn pills in them. My friend, she has, she's 19 and she has like one of those big baggies just full of medication. Yeah. And, you know, you can have those ones where they're planned by the day. And it's like take one of these a day, take half of this a day. Yeah, it's kind of scary thinking about how much we can do it. I mean, heck, I'm to the point where I used to not even want to take ibuprofen or aspirin for a for a headache, I'm now to the age where I'm like, no, that ibuprofen helps <laughs> a lot for the aches and pains as you get older. So we can make these types of molecules. There's also a separate pathway that uh, does lipooxygenase. Lipooxygenase. That creates a last category called leukotrienes. I also decided I wanted to be a chemist over a biologist after I started to, to try to pronounce all the crappy biology stuff. Brittany, are you in Bio 112? Yeah, are you guys doing like phylums and crap like that yet, or is that Bio 111? Yeah, can you even pronounce half that shit? Are you guys in microbiology, like half the bacteria and viruses and shit that Todd makes you have? Can you yeah. even pronounce that stuff? Yeah, it's pretty damn... <laughs> This is why, now, can you, can you say um, hexanoic acid? Yeah, easy, right? Now, I have to admit, if you get t too big on them, most chemistry molecules, the names get ridiculously sucky, too. But chemistry was always much easier for me to pronounce than biology. So we have these sort of series of drugs, and they have different effects on the body. For instance, um, thromboxanes. tend to mediate allergic reactions. And actually, I'm not going to make a distinction. We're just going to lump them all together, mostly because it's not, I don't want you to memorize what each specific one does. I want you to realize that these types of molecules have effects on the body and kind of a general effect. Um, they're also responsible for like tissue inflammation. Um, swelling, redness, soreness, um, leukotrienes specifically are responsible for what most people call asthma, meaning it's an excess of those or allergy attacks. But the general idea I want you to get is that an excess of any of these is bad, right? Meaning it's certainly okay that if you um, get bit by an insect, insect that you get some redness and things like that. It's okay if you pull a muscle or twist something that you get a little bit of swelling, right? But excess swelling is really bad, right? Allergies attacks, it's okay. You, everybody's body has allergy attacks or has allergies, right? Your body gets rid of all of those things. People that have these allergy attacks tend to have an excessive response 
to various things like that. Brittany, are you still suffering from allergies? Oh, I feel sorry for people with allergies. I used to have allergies in Minnesota. I moved here and I have no allergies, so I don't know. I think that's, so you might try moving, Brittany. Maybe it'll make it better. Maybe not, hard to say. Don't go to Oregon. Yeah, go drier and more deserty. Although you would think Rangeley's pretty dry and deserty, honestly. I don't know if you can get much. It's true. Yeah. So the idea is that it's the excess of these that are bad. And so what we do is we can generate a series of drugs that counteract this. Where's my red pen? I want to switch colors. This may or may not let me switch colors. Um, boy, slow. So for instance, we have a series of drugs called NSAIDs. Does anyone know what those are? Yes. So these are non-steroidal, um, gosh, what's the next word? Anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, gosh, what's the I stand for? Now I'm really having mental block. Non steroid, oh, anti, yeah, that's the I in anti inflammatory. There we go. A N S drugs. Non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. And what these non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs do is they simply block or inhibit cyclooxygenase. So one way to stop having a excess of reaction to something is simply to block the production of the molecules that are causing the pain, the redness, the swelling, and things like that. Now, the thing that's bad, though, is that almost every time you block a biological pathway in your body, it seems that you also cause something else to happen. For instance, what does non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have as a drawback? They tend to cause stomach ulcers. Now, of course, there is also another series of things called COX-2 inhibitors. And they inhibit this functional site. So that's why they're called COX-2 inhibitors. Um, their side effect, those increased heart attacks. So if you want to stop things like this, your choices are suffer, just not worry about it, risk stomach ulcers, or risk an increased chance of a heart attack. And it turns out that in this same category is things like aspirin, which is actually naturally found, although I don't think the fact that something's found in nature makes it any better than it's something that isn't. But it does seem to have the least amount of side effects for a lot of these things, although an excess of aspirin can also have side effects and cause, what is it, liver damage, or is that ibuprofen that causes the liver damage? Oh, yeah, ibuprofen is stomach, then aspirin, I think excessive aspirin causes liver damage. I forget. Basically, anytime you take something, if you take it too much, you're probably going to hurt yourself in some way, too. Uh, there is some things like that, too, that, um, uh, you know, if you're blocking the oxygenase and your body just keeps producing more and more of it, you have to take more and more of the drug to get the same effect. <coughs> Excuse me. There are some things like that that occur. So the idea that I want you to take is this idea of the big picture of these metabolic pathways. And so one of the reasons people say omega-6s are bad for you is if you have more omega-6 and you make more of these uh, more of these local hormones, that's the word I'm looking for, um, you're going to have more or exaggerated reactions, right? So one of the things people say is if you cut down on the omega-6 fatty acids and have more omega-3 fatty acids in your diet, then you'll have less of these allergic reactions. Now, I have no idea how easy or hard that is to do to completely cut out omega-6 fatty acids in your body. Your body is also pretty tricky. If you don't have enough of the right compounds, then you also can find that you don't have uh, 
for the right things. I think we'll stop here. Let me think if I want to add one more thing on here. Just let me look and see if I feel like I'm missing anything from my notes. That just goes to waxes. I think there's only one thing I want to add that's random at the tail end of this, and then we'll call it quits. Because we have covered all of that. We covered all of that. Um, we covered all that. One last thing I want to add. This is just sort of random but it fits in on our category. And that's the idea of essential fatty acids. Um, the, the reason they're called essential is that your body cannot synthesize them. Therefore, they have to be gotten in your diet. And there's a number of bad effects that can happen if you don't have an essential fatty acid in your diet. Um, just like we talked about the inability of your body to uh, digest lactose properly and to break down galactose properly, leads to something called galactosemia, which can cause cataracts and problems with your eyes and various other things. Same thing with the fatty acids. There's a list of them in your book. Don't memorize it. I want you to understand what it means, but don't memorize which ones they are. Just like you know, you should know what arachidonic acid is. It's a good example of omega-6. But certainly, I'm not going to make you list the entire list of omega or memorize the entire list of omega-6 fatty acids in the book. One example is usually sufficient for learning things. Just like, you know, I'm not going to expect you to know individually what any of these do. But if one of those four words pops up, you should be able to go, oh, yeah, that's those local hormones. That's our example of a local hormone, right? Um, just like, for instance, in the sugar chapter, do you have to memorize every possible source of glucose? No, but should you know one place you can find glucose? Sure, that's probably a good idea. I usually like one-offs. If I'm asking a really hard test question, I simply go, give me two examples of this. Ha, 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 ha. But usually memorizing one example is good enough. So I don't know if you can actually complete any of the homeworks, uh, 28A and B. So we're not going to make either of them do, but just do as much as you can. I think you can probably do at least the first page of 28A. You can't? What did we not cover? Oh. So what you're really saying is, we're saying is that I, wa I talked really freaking slow today. It was nice.